Hey, thanks for being here with me. We're going to be closing out our look this week at the King is Coming, looking at the second coming of Jesus. And we have looked at the rapture. We've looked at the actual second advent of Jesus Christ, the millennial reign of Christ, although abbreviated. And this week we're looking at the new heavens and the new earth. And when you talk about that, you have to talk about the new Jerusalem. Now, yesterday we looked at... Um, the new heaven and earth being formed, the old is done away with, this is something brand new, this new creation, and then there is this descending of the new Jerusalem, which is talked about throughout Scripture, although it might not be called new Jerusalem. Uh, there are only two places, I think, in the New Testament where that's done, um, and it's not always called Jerusalem. Sometimes it's called the city of Yahweh or uh, other, other names that goes by in prophetic writings. But uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, others talk about uh, Zechariah, talk about this new, this new city, this place that is established by God and that he will dwell with his people and live with them. And so an interesting thing we'll see about that, that John, in this final revelation, uh, this final prophecy concerning that, that eternal dwelling place, that he will use different language than is used by the prophets in the Old Testament. So let's dive into this. We're looking at chapter 21, verses 2 through 4, which speaks of the New Jerusalem. Now, I said yesterday, you really have to go through chapter 22, 5 or 7, something like that to really get this, um, but that takes too long. That is long, and I can't condense that down to a Sunday morning service. So all of these are preparatory for Sunday morning. So I'm building this uh, with the view of preaching it. We'll bring that stuff in, that de the description, because primarily what it does is describe a, the holy city, what it's like, its dimensions, and so forth and so on. And we'll get to that by the end of the week talk about how large the city is and so forth. I probably could have done it today, but it's huge. It's big. It is a great big old place. And it's for, for that reason, you know, like 1,500 uh, miles and so forth and that kind of thing across it. And, you know, people say, oh, it's too big. There's no possible way that a city could be that big. Well, yeah, it is a possible way because it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We don't know how big the new earth's going to be. Don't know how much land mass it's going to have. Don't really know much about it except that it's going to be brand new. It's not going to be a redo of the old one, this present one that we're living in. That's going to be done away with. Uh, it says that several times in Scripture, most pointedly in, in uh, 2 Peter, and then also in Revelation where, uh, that we just saw last week where the, the uh, earth and heaven fled away from the one who sits on the great white throne. And so that's preparing for this new creation. And we saw the new creation yesterday, although briefly. So John writes, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, there are similarity there to the language that's used of the bride of Christ, the church. But the difference is the church is putting on the garments that are the righteous works of the saints. This one is describing a city. Is it linked with the saints of God? Absolutely, no doubt about it. Um, but it is something that is promised for God's people throughout Scripture, uh, this eternal dwelling place. This is descending, and it's a beautiful picture of a bride that is adorned. Now, what that phrase is saying is that this city is gorgeous. This city is beautiful. And when you read the description of it, it is quite mind-boggling to think about the beauty of this city and the, the precious jewels and so forth. And many believe that's a reference back to Isaiah, which talks about God purchasing back his people because of his great love for her, adorning her with jewels and that kind of thing. And so the question becomes, is this a literal city or is this really the, the place of God's people, his saints? Is this where? I think it's one in both. I think it is uh, a legitimate city. I think it is going to be the eternal dwelling of God's saints. And that doesn't mean you're going to stay there all the time. You can go back and forth and to and from. But it is the city of the saints, no doubt about it, uh, those who belong to God. And we'll go back and forth through it. Uh, it is this, the city where God dwells. It is that place that he is. It is the tabernacle of eternity. It is that temple of eternity. And we are priests of, of God, all believers are priests of God. And everyone who goes into this eternal state is a believer, by the way. 
uh, is one of his people that is bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. So everyone that is there, the myriad thousands upon thousands, the, the, all of the people that are there are going to be those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and have a relationship with God through that faith in him and empowered by the Holy Spirit and so forth and so on. And we will have those glorified bodies and we will. this will be the city that we that God dwells with us in the world, in the universe, and that heaven and earth coming together again, that God space and and that earth space becoming united, becoming one, as it was in the Garden of Eden. And although this time it's worldwide, it is throughout the world and indeed the universe, but primarily here upon the new earth. And so it is a beautiful place. It is prepared. It is ready. And here it comes for the fulfillment of the time. And it's been waiting until this time. And this is what he, what he hears. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now, this is not God speaking. More than likely, this is a messenger of God that speaks. We'll see God speak later. This is a messenger of God, an angelic being. It says, behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, is among men. And he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And of course, that harkens back to Exodus. This is a covenant promise that runs throughout Scripture, that God would be with his people forever and ever and ever, and his people would be holy and purified. And this is interesting because as many times as that's repeated in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, here with John, there is a difference. And you miss it in English because we just use people, whether it's singular, this group of people, or whether it's multiple groups, it's still people. We very seldom see it spelled peoples, but you could very well do that here because uh, laos, which means people in the Greek, is plural, uh, laoik. And so you have here the tabernacle of God is among men, or the dwelling place of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them. It's the verb form of that word translated tabernacle. And they shall be his people. And that's, that is plural, meaning all these peoples from various nations. It's not just, not just one ethnic group, Israel. It is multiple ethnicities, and they're all one. The thing, the very thing that in our age, utopias want to accomplish, those who push this progressive vision, bless their hearts, um, I think the heart is in the right place. It's just the, the, the way of doing it is not in the right place. They get that wrong um, because they want to do it without God and quite often really without reason. So the thing that, that everyone wanted to accomplish is this utopian where there is equality and equity, where there is justice, mercy, grace, all of that that we've wanted will be a reality. And the reason it will be a reality is because sin is gone and the child, the offspring of sin is death and that is gone. And because those are gone, sorrow, um, grief, all of that is gone as well. Heartache, bitterness, all of that is gone. Even righteous indignation because there will be no sin, there will be none of that. And that is something that boggles the mind. And yes, there is a tension between bleeding heart liberalism and reason conservatism that, that those two will always be at odds until unified by Christ Jesus. The heart and the mind must come together, and it can only be brought together in Christ Jesus. And so you're going to see this promise fulfilled, and it is a promise from God from Exodus all the way through that he would be his people, he would dwell among them. And it is all uh, one group of people, no, no difference, no distinctions, all one people, the people of God. And that is an awesome thing, and it's so clear in the Greek, but we miss it in the English, and it's such a remarkable statement that it ought to be trumpeted around the world that this is what God is doing. It is not about separating people. It is not about... Um, dividing people up as critical race theory wants to teach our children or those who push critical race theory want to teach our children that um, that you are judged. Uh, oh, we're going to get rid of racism by in, in teaching our children racism. 
that we're to judge people by the color of their skin and what group they're in rather than seeing unity in Christ Jesus and that we are, we are all God's people regardless of our color, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of where we come from. We are all God's people made in his image. We are his children adopted into his family by faith in Christ Jesus who paid the price for us on the cross, who that sin debt done away with defeats sin and death. That is our curse. That's what's upon us. He takes that upon himself so that we might be rescued from it. And how awesome is that, that God has done that in a display of his love for his creation. And so that becomes a reality. Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people. All of them will be his people, and God himself shall be among them. That reality, not that God is not with us now. He is in that sense, but it's not a physical reality as it will be then. We will walk with God. We will walk into his presence, literally, physically, into the presence of God. How awesome is that? And of course, this tabernacling idea goes back to the Shekinah glory that is represented at the, the pillar of fire at night, the cloud by day, uh, the Shekinah glory that descends upon the temple that rests upon the wings of the seraphim in the Holy of Holies. Um, that, that thing that, it, that is talked about there that illustrates the active presence of God with his people, that, that will not be symbolic. That will be a concrete reality that we will see. Not that it was symbolic then because it, 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 is, it was not symbolic. Um, but it is not that physical reality of being in the presence of God. God he put his hand over uh, Moses in the cleft. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock so that I pass by you because no one can see me and live. But in that day, we will see him and live. How remarkable is that? Because the love of God will embrace us. And we have this idea that God is angry with us. He wants to hurt us. He's just mad. He's going to zap us with a lightning bolt. It's not true. His arms are outstretched. He's drawing us to himself. Does he hate sin in our lives? Yes. Does he hate what it does? Yes. Because sin always brings catastrophe. It always brings corruption, contamination, and death. And yes, he's rightly indignant against that because it destroys people. It harms his creation. It harms those that represent his image. And so, yes, he is angry with that, but not at you, not at me. Um, his son is offered that we might have the grace of God, the love of God, the, the sin and death done away with, defeated by Jesus Christ so that we can be declared innocent as he is declared innocent. And we, the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin so that we can be with him and he can be with us as was intended to be. Now, verse 4 is pretty cool. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. What, what tear? Well, anything that causes tears. And what causes tears? Well, I have tears of joy. Okay, great. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about tears of sorrow, tears of grief, tears of agony, all of that. Um, that which produces these tears of sorrow and agony and grief and so forth or anger, that's done away with because there shall no longer be any death. Death's done away with. That in itself is remarkable because we live with this idea of death and we've had it repeated to us for two years. Oh, you, you get COVID, you're going to die. You're going to die. Um, we've lived with this, this almost in death sentence hanging over our head that the government keeps telling us we're going to die. And some people have. I'm not making light of that. What I am saying is that God will do away with that. There will never be that consciousness of death. And, and you know, I was reading a, a study uh, the other day that's talking about, um, actually, I was listening to someone read the study. Uh, it was talking about the damage, psychological damage that's been done to young people, um, elementary school kids and younger, and even, even high school age kids, because they have been told over and over and over and over and over that this thing is a death sentence. Uh, and we've lived with that for two years. And I think it's been politicized. Do I believe the virus is real? Absolutely, I've had it. But do I believe it's been politicized? Yes, I'm not naive enough to think it hasn't been, because it has, because it, it is in certain people's favor for us to be separated at odds and afraid. And uh, I don't believe we should be afraid in Christ. I think uh, perfect love casts out fear. We don't need to be afraid. And so... That which causes tears in our eyes won't exist any longer. No longer any death. No longer any mourning because death is gone, so we won't be mourning. No grief, crying, pain. 
the first things have passed away. That includes the, this world we live in, this first world. That's passed away. The contamination of sin that is in it. And the contamination of sin that is in these bodies that we inhabit, that's gone too. And we have a new glorified body that sin has never touched. And how marvelous will that be? And we're going to be already being renewed in our minds and in our spirits so that we will be uh, fit for that eternal place, that eternal living that we're going to have in those glorified bodies. And, um, and all of this is passed away. All of this will be gone. The, the mourning, the crying, the pain, and, and all of that that brings that in. And to me, all of that that we know, if you think just for a moment of all of the times that you've been sorrowful, all the times there's been grief, all the times that there has been agony, all the times that there has been worry and anxiety and upset and all of that that goes with that, that'll be gone. That's God's promise to us. John sees it as fulfilled. All of this that we long for in our heart of hearts, peace, security, safety, um, no death, no separation, love, uh, great, all of that will be a physical, real-time, concrete reality for us, and we get to experience that. Now, is all of that true already for believers? Yes, in a sense it is, in the spiritual sense, in a very real sense, although spiritually. Our tears have been wiped away. We have joy indescribable. We have eternal life right now, but death has been defeated, but we are going to go through the doorway of death. We still deal with the corruption and contamination of sin. That's still a reality for us, even though we know that that's been done away with. And we have this sure and certain hope. Remember, hope in the New Testament or in Scripture, it's not, well, maybe it'll happen, and I sure hope it does. It is a certainty. It is, I know it's going to happen. I'm longing for it to take place now. That's our hope of this eternity that we're talking about now, the new Jerusalem and a new heaven and new earth. Um, where God and his space meets earth and they're united as it should be. And uh, man, I look forward to that and I hope that you do too. And all of that displays the love, grace, and mercy of God for his creation, for people, and for his all of his creation really, but ultimately people, supremely people, uh, that, that his embrace of us, that his love for us, loves us so much, loves you so much, he gave... It's only begotten Son, Jesus, that you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. And if you have those, you have his shalom, his peace that surpasses understanding, wholeness, and completeness. And the assurance, the assurance of the new heaven, new earth, and the new Jerusalem that we get to experience. How marvelous is that? Well, listen, we're going to talk some more about that tomorrow. I look forward uh, to sharing that with you tomorrow. Until then, I pray God's blessings rest upon you always. See you tomorrow.